Hello everyone, Kanasa here and welcome back to Coming Home Redux. In this episode, we are going to be sending the Hydrus AEPM over to Hydrus, which is going to be an uncrewed mission that will perform absolutely everything that we could ever want from an uncrewed mission to Hydrus, except for sending some sort of flying device over to that actual planet. No, we're going to be doing a sample return. We're going to be scan satting the hell out of that place. We are going to be sending a telescope that will scan for liquid deuterium on the moon. And we are going to be returning all of that important data back to Rogue. That's right. We are going to be doing sample returns on both the planet and the moon Hydron. So that's why this mission is all rather big and chunky and it's going to take quite a while to do this. So I have split this into two parts because this video anyway is going to be 14 minutes long, which is kind of reaching, well, if I wanted to do this and the actual mission to Hydrus all in the same video, yeah, no, video, that's the what one of these is, well, that would have taken probably at least 30 minutes, and that is way over the upper limit of what I like my videos to be, because for some reason, I'm not looking at you, TikTok, everyone these days wants to have really short content, so anything over 20 minutes is bad, and YouTube goes, no, I'm not going to show you to new people, so that's why, unfortunately, I am going to be splitting these into two separate videos. What we're working on right Right now, though, is the ScanSat modules that we are going to be sending over on this mission. They're going to be packed with a load of LFO. They have every single scan satellite object on them that I could fit. The only scan that we're not going to be able to get from these is going to be high resolution visual imaging, which is a little bit of a shame, but those parts are frankly massive. So I didn't really find a way of fitting those onto those scan satellites. What we are looking at right now is going to be the deuterium scanner. So this isn't really going to have a use at the moment moment because I don't have any fancy fusion technology, but future me in this series will probably thank me for setting this up so I know where to locate the deuterium so I can create some big fusion contraptions that are going to harvest the deuterium and perform nuclear fusion and give me some sort of torch drives. It's going to be amazing. It's going to be great. So the fact that we're setting up this infrastructure now, I will thank myself down the line. That is something that I am really looking forward to. We will be able to make torch drives, all of those kind of fancy stuff in this series, but that is still going to be quite a long way off. What we're going to be working on now though, however, is going to be a pod that we are going to return to the surface of road. Obviously, we are going to be collecting samples from Hydrus, from Hydron, we want to be able to bring those safely back down to our home planet. So I've gone for an experiment storage unit and we're just gonna cover it up with this big gray piece of tubing, add some RCS, add a heat shield, add some sort of power parachutes, and we'll just yeet this back at road and hopefully gain a lot of science from the recovery of some of those weird magnetic floaty rocks that do litter the surface of Hydrus. Yes, there are a lot of floating rocks in the atmosphere that we do want to test because maybe we could make some sort of hover technology out of those later on in this series. I don't know. Who who knows why the rocks float? How do magnets work? Beats me. Anyway, we have designed most of the components for this now, and what we're gonna be doing is putting them all together on the actual main structure of this mission. So I did not show you the construction of the return missions, so the, the lander and the orbiter of the Hydra's part of the mission, because to be honest, that would have been really boring viewing. It would have been pretty bad because I just did the same thing over and over and over again, making slight tweaks watching that not great viewing what we're working on now though is going to be the engine section of this and we are going to be using an atomic NVGX engine the liberator or the emancipator or I, I think it's the liberator it's a very big nuclear engine has ridiculous specific impulse in vacuum we can only burn it for 457 seconds though due to the fact that it does require enriched uranium which it can only take from the engine part we can't refuel that and as soon as we've burned that for 457 seconds well it's all gone not that that matters though because we're still going to get something like 8000 9000 meters per second of delta v from this it's insane but with that all being done, what we're going to be doing now is doing a bit of cleanup around the road system. So I have been a little bit of a donut and let my astronauts or my kerbonauts on the totally reliable assembly platform, trap for short, starve. They have turned to tourists. So what we're going to do is grab the other crew manta that I didn't touch in the last episode that we launched. And we are going to rescue the six kerbals that are on board that station. Now, six kerbals on a station do not fit into a four crew capacity spacecraft. 
No matter what I tell myself, they do not fit. Do not try and fit more than four Kerbals on that spacecraft, I should have been telling myself. But no, I tried to get five on there because I noticed in Ship Manifest that it did say that, oh look, you can fit more people in here. Ship Manifest was quite clearly lying to me. So I tried to fit Pitcairn Kerman in and he unfortunately vanished. He turned into nothingness. It was as if Thanos snapped him out of existence. But he did manage to come back to the astronaut center later on but he is now a tourist, he is a permanent tourist, so we've not really had a death in this series yet, but I think that's as close as we've gotten to one, and yes, it's a little bit unfortunate, so sorry Pitcairn Kerman for trying to squeeze you into a tiny box that you did not want to go in, that was a bit of a blunder on my part. Anyway, we are now bringing the crew manta back down. Once again, I forgot, well, I haven't forgotten this is the same design as we sent up in the last episode. So there is no wheel on the front. Is it the last episode? It might have even been the episode before. I can't remember, but there is no wheel on the front of this. So we are going to nose down and just sit there like that. I have since made a better Manta, a better Crew Manta, one where we can send one up at a time as well, and it has wheels, it has three wheels, so it shouldn't collapse on the ground as soon as we touch down, which we will see maybe in the, not the next episode, because that'll be at Hydrus, but the episode after. It's going to be pretty cool, we're going to use it to go over to Armstrong and perform a reconnaissance mission, I think. Anyway, what we're working on right now is a massive supply run to the totally reliable assembly platform because as I said, we are out of supplies. We've got the new Proxima rocket that can take 200 tons up to low road orbit. Rather than doing loads of piddly little ones all over the place, well, why don't we just fill a 200 ton boat full of supplies, full of material kits, specialized parts, fertilizer, supplies, yes, everything. And we'll send that all up in one go on the new big boy chonky rocket. And that's exactly what we're going to be doing. This is going to also be able to contain quite a bit of liquid fuel and oxidizer, which will be nice. But here we are on the launch pad taking it. I think the engine that I used for the orbital stage for this was the Wolfhound. Obviously, that is quite good in vacuum. I think it's 370 seconds Pacific Impulse in vacuum, which for a stock liquid fuel oxidizer engine is not that bad. But in the blink of an eye, we are able to get Proxima to launch this rather large payload up to orbit. And we're going to go screaming past that, <laughs> the core stage of Proxima, taking care not to smash into it. Anyway, we are now at the station, and I'm fairly sure Ducky Kerman, who is the last remaining Kerbal on board that station, is very relieved to see supplies arriving. To be honest, if it was me, all alone, and all of my astronaut Kerbanaut colleagues had left me with no food, I think I would have started wrecking stuff. I would have broken stuff, and that's exactly what Ducky Kerman is going to do. He's going to disassemble the parts on the end of this, but not because he was mad, no, because I actually told him to. I thought that that end looked quite cool on the end of the Tantive 4 module of the space station. Yes, someone in a comment in the last video did mention that that anchor, the, the head, the liquid fuel section of this space station did look like the head of a Corellian Corvette from Star Wars which I, I, I kind of agree on, and I think that shall now be <laughs> known as the Tentive 4 module. Anyway, we are going to try and bring Ducky Kerman safely back down, and the only transport that we have on board, well, it's not the only one, we do have the escape pod, but we have a cargo buzzard, the last one in active service. Now I want to get rid of this because these things are death traps and I just want to get rid of them completely. We did need a crew member on board to fly it, so Ducky, unfortunately the job fell to you. You are an engineer, you're not even a pilot, so I don't know how you were going to be able to fly this. As we can see, the entire thing spins quite rapidly out of control constantly. Not the best. Really not good, and it was at this precise moment that I was really fearing for Ducky Kerman's life. Are we going to see our first death in this series? Fortunately not, because we do manage to gain control. We're only moving about 100 meters per second, but the control on this is really awful. The yaw control is just terrible. These used to work before I had my break when GPU died. These did fly. I don't know why when coming back they are so hard to control, but with that sort of touchdown, the explodey touchdown, well that will be the last time we ever use one of these. We are going to be relying on the Mantas, of which we are launching two now, because the two 
here, well, this was before I developed the new Manta X or the new Manta 2 or whatever you want to call it. That should be in, like I said, in a couple of episodes time. And look at this! I do have to give a massive thanks to Cat Car Keys on the Discord for developing a new multi-vessel tracking screen that looks so much more professional than I did. Basically, I was there, I got my graphics software, GIMP is what I use, I threw some paint at it and I tried to make it look all cool, but I'm no graphic designer and I've said that. I. I not very good at doing it. The best that I can do is my thumbnails and even then I only started using this kind of software when I started my channel to make thumbnails and to make some cool effects like this but having only done that for a couple of years and not really focusing on it well yeah I'm not the best at doing it so this is so much better. It looks really good and once again I do have to say a massive Thank you. So while we're waiting for the rest of this mission to take place, what I'm going to do is talk about obviously the video that I released on Friday, which was the how to install RP1 video, the meme video. I had a few people asking me if I'm going to do carry on my series like I did with that video. I'm not because I feel like that would be a massive jump away from how these series are going to play out. What I will be doing though, is I am going to be planning on doing more videos like that, but they're going to be one-off videos. They're not going to be tied into any series. I might even do a tutorial series on RP1, RP1, RP1 on that, but I do have a few ideas that I am going to be using that style for because judging from the reaction to that video, people really enjoyed that. So I do want to carry on with those. Obviously, if you guys like it, I will carry on and I will make more of them. So I'm going to try and do maybe a coming home episode a week. And I'm also going to try and do a video of that style a week. But those videos do take a lot longer to do. I did mention in the live stream that I did yesterday that for four minutes of video, that probably took me about 16 hours, 16 to 20 hours to script it, to do all of the editing, get all of the footage. It, it, it took a long time. So I'm going to try and get one of those out a week, but we'll see how that goes. Anyway, with that being aside, what we are doing now is building the Hydrus AEPM, we've got a crew of three engineers on here, which is less than what we had before. So it is going to take a little bit longer to actually build this up. Obviously, I should have given this video a bit of a seizure warning because the flashing around Hydrus, not even Hydrus Road there was a little bit uncomfortable. But just like that, the three engineers on board are able to make this rather chunky probe mission. Like that is just a mission to send some probes to Hydrus. The rescale of this series is really causing my craft to be ludicrously big, but I suppose that's always fun. Anyway, we are going to fire up that atomic NVGX engine and make our way over, performing a burn incredibly quickly. And as we can see, we have managed to get ourselves a nice encounter with that planet. And in the next episode, what we will be focusing on is the missions around Hydrus. Will the mission perform as advertised or will everything go terribly wrong? Who knows? Well, I do because I've already filmed it, but you don't because the video's not out yet. But we we will see that hopefully next week. I'm sure I can get that done in time. But until then, I hope you've enjoyed this video. If you have, why not give it a like? If you've really enjoyed it and want to continue with the content on my channel, please do consider subscribing. I have been Karnasa, and I will see you later.